Greetings, folks, and welcome to another edition of History Up Close, sponsored by the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation and brought to you by Hellcat Productions. We're thrilled to be back with you after several weeks off for our 4th of July vacation, and we figured we'd come back with a splash, as today we're going to talk about one of the most iconic airplanes in naval aviation, if not in all aviation history, the venerable F4U Corsair, as you see behind me here. And we're very, very fortunate to have Kim Sheldon, our top tour guide, come talk to us about this wonderfully iconic airplane. Kim, take it away. Thank you, Captain Gillum. Sailors and Marines called it the bent wing bird. Some naval aviators called it the old hose nose. Japanese troops in World War II called it the whistling death. Whatever it's known to Gare, the Vought F4U Corsair was a legendary combat aircraft that saw action in a world war and a half dozen other conflicts. It was the first single engine propeller aircraft in the world to exceed 400 miles per hour in straight and level flight. It bore the brunt of the brutal air-to-air -air combat during the American island hopping campaign in the Solomon Islands. It established an 11 to 1 kill to loss ratio in, against its aerial opposition. It established local air superiority over dozens of marine beachheads in the Pacific and it evolved into a superlative fighter bomber that the Marine, capable of carrying 5,000 pounds of ordnance, which the Marines called the Sweetheart of Okinawa. As a further testament to its rugged and adaptable design, the Corsair continued to serve on the Navy's aircraft carriers well into the jet age, even going so far as to down a, a communist MiG-15 jet in a dogfight over Korea. It had the longest production run of any propeller-driven U.S. fighter, starting in 1940 and going through 1952. It is arguably the finest naval fighter to emerge from the crucible of World War II, and it is my distinct privilege to be able to share this aircraft with you today during this episode of History Up Close at your Naf National Museum of Naval Aviation. The specifications the Navy demanded were very extreme. It had to be the fastest fighter plane in the world. It had to be able to fly slow enough to land on an aircraft carrier. It had to be rugged enough to endure the high impact with what is essentially a controlled crash landing on a carrier. It had to have folding wings, it had to have a heavy battery of machine guns to enable it to shoot down its opposition, and it had to do all of this with a single engine. Now aircraft designers in the 1930s had to choose between one of two types of aircraft engines. There were your liquid-cooled inline engines, and there were your air-cooled radial engines. Now radial engine, liquid-cooled uh, inline engines uh, tended to be heavier because they involved having a radiator and all the plumbing associated with circulating coolant. Their advantage was that they offered a small frontal area which made streamlining very efficient. Uh, therefore, a lot of uh, aircraft designers uh, from all over the world uh, during the 1930s tended to prefer inline liquid-cooled engines in fighter plane design. So uh, inline engines like uh, Rolls-Royce's Merlin V12 and uh, the Allison V1710 uh, and the Daimler-Benz DB605 uh, were favored for fighter planes and fighters like the Messerschmitts and the Spitfires and the P-38s and the P-40s were all sleek looking fast fighter planes uh, and to the point where uh, in the 1930s the Army Air Corps Chief of Staff General Hap Arnold issued a memorandum to American manufacturers saying that henceforth uh, no American Air Force uh, fighter planes would be uh, equipped with radial engines. The Navy, however, preferred radial engines because with the limited space they had on, air, on board uh, aircraft carriers and the long ranges that were required of their airplanes, the lightweight uh, and easy to maintain aspect of radial engines was their preference. Chance Fought Aircraft of Stratford, Connecticut uh, was working closely with Pratt & Whitney engines uh, who had developed an experimental radial engine called the XR2800. This at the time was the most powerful radial engine in the world and Chance Vought decided that they would work with Pratt & Whitney in designing a new fighter plane to answer the Navy's request for proposals. They assigned their chief engineer Rex Beisel to the job and he decided to work and build the model V-166B airplane around the Pratt & Whitney R-2800 engine, which at that time produced 1,850 horsepower on takeoff. The double WASP engine was an 18-cylinder engine, and it drove, because of the power it produced, 
uh, it really required that a large, the largest possible propeller uh, be applied to it. So they selected the Hamilton Standard three-bladed propeller, which was 13 feet and four inches in diameter. This is, a, this is the largest propeller on any single engine airplane in the world at the time, and this presented Vought with a problem. Uh, how do you design an airplane for carrier use that gives enough clearance for a propeller not to hit the ground, but not yet have a long, stocky landing gear that was going to be subject to braking easily on hard impacts? Rex Bizel cleverly decided to adapt a gull or inverted gull wing design, which would allow the wing to come down close enough to the ground to allow for a stockier and shorter landing gear able to withstand the high impact but at the same time allow the propeller to clear the deck. So this distinctive gull wing or inver inverted gull wing design became characteristic of the uh, airplane. V-166B first flew on May 29, 1940. In keeping with their earlier tradition of naming uh, Navy designs Corsairs, uh, Chance Fought named this airplane the Corsair. The Navy designated it the XF4U1. Now the Corsair incorporated a number of innovative uh, design features. And the first was, Bizel decided uh, to wrap the tightest possible cowling he could around the R2800 engine to minimize drag and, uh, and provide aerodynamic efficiency. And he also incorporated variable position cooling flaps to allow the engine to be efficiently cooled in flight depending on its airspeed. Ram air for the airplane's supercharger, the engine supercharger, and the oil cooler uh, ducts were in, buried in the root of the wing, leading edges of the wings. The airframe was of semi-monocoque design and the other innovations it used was uh, uh, ample use of spot welding the aluminum skin, the stressed aluminum skin to the frame as well as flush riveting. So it was a very aerodynamically clean airplane. Another aerodynamic efficiency was that where the wings attached to the fuselage was a 90 degree angle. This uh, eliminated the need for uh, fairings or fillets and was the most aerodynamically efficient way of attaching the wings to the airplane. The landing gear retracted aft and the wheels turned 90 degrees so that they could lie flat and completely embedded within the wing which was closed up and this was a, a, another aerodynamic efficiency that Bizel designed into the Corsair. The Corsair also had uh, slotted uh, wing flaps on the trailing edges of both wings to enable it to, to uh, operate in the low speed uh, environment around the aircraft carrier. The initial airplane uh, armament consisted of a single 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine gun in the cowling firing through the prop arc and, uh, and 50 caliber machine gun in each wing. The, the initial prototype Corsair also included small bomb bays in the outer wing panels of each wing that were designed to hold uh, little bombs that, were, uh, that were intended to be dropped on enemy bomber formations from above. Subsequent flight tests before War and Navy Department officials uh, clocked 405 mile per hour top speed and this was enough it was said to convince General Arnold who was in the audience uh, to change his mind about radial engines leading eventually to the procurement of a radial engine R2800 driven Republic P-47 Thunderbolt for the Army Air Force. The Navy subsequently awarded a contract to Vought for 584 F-4U-1s. In order to help Vought uh, single factory in Connecticut meet its production quotas, the Navy subcontracted with Goodyear in Ohio and Brewster in Pennsylvania to produce Corsairs under license. And these aircraft were designated FG-1 and F-3A-1 respectively. The airplane we actually have here in the museum is actually a Goodyear built FG-1D. By the time production of the F-4U ended in 1952, more than 12,000 Corsairs of all models had been produced. Experience learned from air battles over Europe led the Navy to make several design changes requests to chance fought about the Corsair. The first was deleting the little bomb bays underneath each of the wings, dispensing with that, and taking the uh, inner wing fuel tanks and consolidating them with a larger fuselage fuel tank in front of the cockpit. Now this d required them to move the cockpit six feet further aft, making a total of 12 feet from the cockpit to the, to the nose, the leading edge of the nose. Uh, the other thing they did was purge uh, put a CO2 uh, purge system in the outer wing cell, uh, fuel cells, which were eventually deleted anyway. Uh, and they consolidated the armament. Instead of the 30 caliber and the 50 caliber in the nose and the 250s in the wings, 
They replaced the Corsair's armament with a total of six Browning M2 50 caliber machine guns, three in each wing. Now I'm going to talk about the cockpit as we move around the uh, starboard side here. Uh, I'll show you how uh, the pilots got up into the cockpit of this monster of an airplane. Follow me around to, and I'll show you how we get into the cockpit of the aircraft. The production versions of the Corsair were equipped with the Pratt & Whitney R2800 engine, which had now an uprated uh, horsepower rating of 2,000 horsepower on takeoff. Getting into the Corsair required a little bit of gymnastics, but the engineers at uh, Vought uh, did put in some helpful uh, hand grips and, and kick steps. The kick step in the flap you see here was a late feature of the later model Corsairs. It wasn't present on the first production Corsairs, but it made it possible for the pilot to put one foot in, reach up here and grab a handhold and put his other foot into this flap on top of the wing. Another hand hold and a foothold here and you can see that getting into the cockpit was, a, was an exercise in, uh, in acrobatics, for, especially for short guys like me. Now the cockpit uh, in the early model Corsairs had no floor in it. They had a pair of foot troughs the pilot could rest his feet in while he was operating the rudder pedals, uh, but between his legs uh, and underneath the seat there was nothing but the bottom of the airplane. So anything he dropped, like a, a, a knee board or a pencil, uh, that all went down to the bottom of the airplane. If he was unfortunate enough to have a uh, hydraulic leak, uh, he wasn't protected from that either. The early model Corsairs still had a little uh, bomb viewing window in the bottom of the belly of the aircraft the pilot could look through, and this was a holdover from uh, the design feature of having those little bomb bays in the wings. Uh, eventually, the, the later model Corsairs had that uh, paneled over with uh, sheet metal. Uh, it's not present in this airplane here in the museum, but in front of the gun sight uh, and behind the windshield in the cockpit, there was a pane of bulletproof glass. The pilot's seat and back rest were armored against uh, uh, small caliber uh, weapons up to 50 caliber uh, machine gun rounds. And it was, by the standards of the day, was a pretty roomy cockpit. Now the early model Corsairs, the F4U1s, were equipped with a heavily framed plexiglass uh, sliding hood here, which they frequently referred to as the birdcage. Uh, this restricted visibility quite a bit. And in order to compensate for that, initially Vought actually incorporated a little bubble on top of the windscreen, on top of the canopy, to house a rear view mirror. And there were a pair of small cutout windows behind the pilot's seat. Uh, which afforded them not that much uh, ability to see behind them. The later models of the Corsair had this blown hood, a semi-bubble blown hood, which afforded much more guns, delivering a heavy punch of 80 1.6 ounce rounds per second. Ammunition included armor-piercing incendiary, ball, or tracer, and with 2,300 rounds loaded in the aircraft's feed chutes, the pilot had about 30 seconds of firing time. Uh, this was more than adequate to flame an unarmored uh, enemy aircraft, especially one without self-sealing fuel tanks, and was oftentimes sufficient to cut a small enemy vessel in two with a sustained burst. First squadron deliveries were to the Navy's VF-12 at North Island in San Diego, the Marine Corps' VMF-124 at nearby Camp Kearney, also in San Diego, and the Navy's VF-17 Jolly Rogers in Oceana, Virginia. A litany of problems surfaced during the Navy's uh, carrier trials for the Corsair, not the least of which was the pilot's uh, poor forward visibility because of the 12 foot long nose. Uh, the other problem was that uh, inordinately stiff landing gear oleos caused the airplanes to bounce a lot on landing, causing the uh, resting hook to skip over the resting wires. Uh, these problems were all eventually solved, but the Navy, after 14 accidents, deemed the F4U unsuitable for carrier use and decided instead to opt for the F6F Hellcat as a much more docile aircraft in the landing pattern. As frequently happened, the Marine Corps ended up getting the Navy's hand-me-downs uh, for use as land-based aircraft to support the uh, island hopping campaign in the Solomons. Admiral Bill Halsey desperately needed Marine air cover for his island hopping campaign up the Solomons, and uh, Marine squadrons began replacing their worn out F4. In late 1943, a revised model Corsair, the F4U1A, began replacing the birdcage Corsairs. Uh, one of the major changes with the F4U1A was the deletion of the birdcage canopy and uh, replacing it with a semi bubble canopy with only a pair of reinforcing braces. Uh, and also the engine, the R2800 engine, was upgraded with something called a water methanol uh, 
injection system, which allowed the pilot to select something called War Emergency Power, or WEP, for up to five minutes. This added an additional 250 horsepower to the 2,000 uh, horsepower he already had with that engine. Get out of scrapes you might encounter during a dogfight. Two other important improvements were raising the pilot seat by six inches to give him better visibility, and also raised the uh, tailwheel strut by six inches, which raised the tail, gave the pilot a little better forward visibility, but also got the elevators up out of the, uh, out of the shadow, if you will, uh, of the main wing, which made it uh, easier uh, to take off and land. Despite a rough beginning, the Corsairs were more than a match for the Japanese Navy's legendary A6M Zero fighter plane. Vought equipped the Corsair with an engine that could get it out of trouble as fast as it got into it. The Corsair could outrun and outclimb the Zero, and above 10,000 feet and 200 knots, it could also outturn the Zero because of the uh, superlative aileron roll control and the Zero's tendency to uh, encounter stiff controls above at high speeds. The Corsair's rugged construction and protection of pilot and fuel tanks enabled the Corsair frequently to endure and survive uh, combat damage and bring its pilots home uh, to fight again. The Zero did not. In April 1943, the uh, new model of the Corsair, the F4U-1D, was delivered to the Navy. Now this was a factory built model that was uh, intended as a fighter bomber. And some of the features that this added to the basic Corsair were a couple hard points underneath the stub wings here to uh, hold uh, up to 1,000 pound bombs per, stub, per uh, pylon and also zero length uh, launch rails on the outer wing panels for up to eight five inch rockets. In June 1943, Britain's Royal Navy took delivery of the first of up to 1,000 Corsairs under Lend-Lease. Accustomed as they were to adapting land-based Royal Air Force designs for carrier use, the Royal Navy soon developed a technique that would solve the problem the U.S. Navy had had with getting Corsairs aboard. The pilot, Corsair pilot flew a continuous descending turn from the abeam position until just before rolling wings level across the deck edge, which enabled him to keep the landing signal officer or the batsman in Royal Navy parlance in, in sight until the last moment. This solved the problem of how to get Corsairs aboard the carrier. Six months later, the U.S. Navy and Marines followed suit, and the, carrier, and the Corsair was soon ready to go back to sea. The first Corsair squadrons to go to sea aboard Navy aircraft carriers were Marine squadrons, VMF-124 and VMF-213, aboard USS Essex in December of 1944. The Navy was rushing to get the speedier Corsairs to the fleet to help stem a new threat, posed by the kamikaze suicide attackers, which had first hit the fleet during the liberation of the Philippines in October of 1944. The desperate need for more fighters aboard the carriers prompted the Navy to actually adopt all Corsair uh, air wings on some of its aircraft carriers, uh, shore basing their dive bomber and torpedo squadrons in favor of the more uh, multi-purpose F4Us. In July 1945, the F4U-4 Corsair entered the war zone with a couple marine squadrons of the type arriving on Okinawa just in time to engage the kamikaze onslaughts. The Dash 4 had a more powerful double wasp engine of 2300 horsepower and a four-bladed prop giving it a top speed of 449 miles per hour and a payload of 4,000 pounds. With the end of World War II and disarmament, the Navy faced uh, severe cutbacks in ships, aircraft, and personnel. Despite being well into the jet age, the Corsair remained the backbone of the Navy's uh, attack uh, and fighter bomber uh, air wings on board its aircraft carriers. By 1946, the Hellcat was gone from frontline service, and the next generation of Corsair arrived in the form of the F4U-5. The Dash 5 was the fastest of the breed at 470 miles per hour. It had a longer nose and it had a payload of 5,000 pounds. Together with the Dash 4, this model of Corsair formed the backbone of Navy and Marine Corps attack and fighter, squadron, uh, fighter bomber squadrons during the Korean War. A dedicated ground attack version of the Corsair, the AU-1, arrived in time for combat in Korea in, starting in 1952. At the end of the Korean War, the Navy began phasing out the Corsair from frontline service and the French Navy's Aero Naval began acquiring uh, surplus AU-1 Corsairs and a new version made especially for them by Vought, the F4U-7 Corsair. The French used the Dash 7 and the AU-1 uh, in combat in their wars in Indochina, Algeria, Tunisia, and the Suez Crisis in 1956. And the last F4U-7 in French service 
was retired in 1964. The last Corsairs in service anywhere were in Latin America with the Argentinian Navy and the Air Forces of El Salvador and Honduras. The last combat use of the Corsair occurred during the 1969 soccer war between El Salvador and Honduras. The Corsair was the right plane in the right place at the right time in the Pacific War and evolved into much more than a superior fighter plane. Its evolution into what became the Navy's first true strike fighter is a legacy which continues today in the form of the F-A-18 Super Hornet, which is now the mainstay of the carrier air group. That being said, I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have. Oh, yeah, there were there are actually two uh, night fighter versions. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, two night uh, fighter versions of the, uh, the Corsair. One in World War II was the F-4U-2, uh, and that the modification involved a radar, an air-to-air -air intercept radar uh, on the starboard wingtip. Uh, it blended with the leading edge of the wing, and in order to make uh, the counter the, uh, the additional weight, they took one of the 50 caliber machine guns out, uh, so they only had two 50s in the, in the right wing in the 350s in the left wing. Uh, the night fighter version that served in the Korean War was the F-4U-5N uh, for night fighter. It, ha it also had an air-to-air -air intercept radar in a dome on the right-hand wing, uh, but it carried, uh, instead of 50 caliber machine guns, it carried uh, 20 millimeter cannons, uh, two in each wing, uh, giving up, although it had less ammunition, uh, it had uh, a much heavier punch because of the uh, uh, lower muzzle vo velocity, but the higher weight of the, of the uh, projectile. Uh, the Dash 5 engine, as I mentioned earlier, what the Dash 5 version of the Corsair was the fastest of the breed, uh, 470 miles per hour in straight and level flight. Uh, and uh, the modification with the higher rated engine involved about a 10, 8 or 10 inch extension of the forward fuselage. So it actually had a much longer nose than the previous models of Corsair. And in order to counteract the uh, additional torque, they actually moved the, uh, the line of the engine downward a little bit, so the, the uh, pilot actually had a lower sitting nose, so they, they actually improved the pilot's forward vision in the Dash 5 uh, November night fighter version, as well as the plain Dash 5s. Okay. Uh, Tom wondered what model went to the four-blade prop, and Tom asked, I'm sure the extra torque made fun to carry your trap. <laughs> it always did. Uh, the, even with the uh, earlier versions of the 2800 engine, the F4U uh, was, uh, was uh, not for complacent pilots, especially in the landing pattern. Uh, there was a tendency, as they had found in the first carrier suitability trials, for the airplane to uh, stall uh, the left wing as they were in a left hand descending turn. Uh, the left wing would see less airflow over it than the right wing did. Uh, so they attached a triangular uh, leading edge strip to the wing here to help actually make the right wing stall a little bit earlier. Uh, but yeah, the four-bladed prop was first introduced on the Dash 4 Corsair, uh, which started arriving in the war zone in July of 1945 on Okinawa. Yeah, Al comments that uh, a lot of people don't know that the Corsairs flew ground support missions during the early period of U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Do you have any information on that? I don't know that the U.S. was involved uh, using Corsairs. Uh, what happened was, just as the American uh, involvement in Korea was winding down in late 53, uh, the, the French uh, uh, war in Indochina was ramping up and in fact uh, under the Eisenhower administration and what they called the military assistance program, uh, F4U4s and AU1 Corsairs were transferred directly from Marine Corps squadrons in Japan to the French uh, to fight uh, in 1954-1955. By, by, uh, by the, the uh, end of the Korean War, they were uh, <laughs> using um, the uh, Corsair just with the French in, in Vietnam. Okay. Um, and Janice was wondering about the maneuverability of the aircraft. Uh, any particular maneuvers that were popular to use against the enemy? And were there any uh, maneuvers that you wanted to avoid that would put a, a strain on the aircraft during air-to-air -air combat? Um, let me use the mic. 
The uh, aircraft, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, had a great roll, roll rate and uh, the, the advantage of that high roll rate with the Corsair, especially in a situation where they were jumped by a, a Japanese fighter, would be if he had enough altitude, trade altitude for airspeed and go into a right, a tight right turn, uh, the Zero could not follow them in those high, high G, high speed maneuvers because of compressibility would lock up their, their controls. Uh, so that was a, a popular escape uh, method that they could use, you know, if they had the altitude to do it. Um, I'm not, a, I wasn't a Corsair pilot, so I couldn't tell you about the, uh, the other tricks of the trade that they might have had, but the roll rate of the Corsair was, was one of its high advantages or made it so effective as an air to air fighter. Okay. Um, Another uh, question that has come in is, uh, is it true that the uh, British versions of the F4U that they operated had clipped wings? Yes, that's true. When the British uh, uh, got their first Corsairs from the Americans in, in 1943 uh, on Lend-Lease, uh, aircraft carriers in the British Navy had armored flight decks. And what that meant was that on the hangar deck, uh, they only had a clearance from the, from the main deck to the uh, overhead or the ceiling of about 16 feet. When the Corsair's wings are folded here, the wings sit 16 feet 6 inches above the ground. So the uh, British had uh, Vought initially clip about 8 inches uh, off of each wing and they attached a wooden uh, uh, end plate there and uh, that, that solved the problem. Not only that, but the added benefit was with the shorter wingspan, the British Corsairs actually had a higher roll rate than the Americans without the clipped wings. Okay, uh, one final question we have is, uh, could you comment on the F2G Super Corsair, as they call yeah. it? Uh, the F2G Super Corsair was a uh, design that the Navy approached Goodyear. Goodyear was one of the main subcontractors for Corsairs during the war, and in order not to uh, tie up Vought production in, in their Stratford uh, factory, they went to Goodyear in Ohio and asked them to develop uh, an upgraded uh, engine uh, called the Pratt & Whitney R4300, a uh, double, or I'm sorry, WASP major engine, which produced 3,500 horsepower. And what the Navy really wanted was an airplane that could get up to altitude very, very quickly. They wanted it to be fast too, but it was more important that it got up to altitude quickly because that was the optimal position to place interceptors to intercept uh, incoming raids against our carrier task forces. So the F2G was called, the F2G Super Corsair uh, had the uh, four row, 28 cylinder uh, R4300 WASP major engine which gave it a phenomenal, more than 6,000 foot per minute rate of climb. It wasn't all that much faster. Matter of fact, it was a little bit slower than the Dash 4 Corsair, uh, but it was a, a real uh, screamer when it came to getting to altitude quickly. And the other thing was that they cut down the rear fuselage and gave it a P-47 Thunderbolt style teardrop canopy. Uh, so at, in the event, by, that time, by the time that airplane came online in early 45, the Navy had already started to go with the F-8F Bearcat as a high speed, high altitude interceptor. And so I think production only went to about 12 airplanes. But after the war, uh, the Navy uh, raced these in the re-established uh, Cleveland National Air Races, and they flew those for about uh, three or four years until some bad crashes uh, put a stop to the uh, air races. Those didn't start up again until they moved it to Reno in 1964. Now, that, that concludes our questions for the Corsair today. Thank you for sending those in. Just want to remind you all that on August 6th here at the museum, if you'll join us again for Facebook Live, we will be featuring the PBY Catalina. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sorry. I couldn't. We lost the mic. Well, apparently, Buddy said he couldn't hear you. Uh, our equipment shows a perfect audio, so I don't know. Okay.